How's that? Um, I'm Mike Markowitz. Um, about 24 years ago, I uh, came to CNA to work on war games with uh, my mentors, Dr. Peter Perla and Dr. Ed McGrady. Uh, the first 10 years are the hardest. After that, they stop calling you the new guy. Um, what I'd like to uh, share with you today is what uh, I've uh, learned in about six decades of wargaming. I've been a wargamer since I was nine years old, and I've designed war games since I was about 11. And uh, in that many years, you can pick up a few tips and tricks. I love this quote from Pablo Picasso. Um, there's a lot of uh, ink spilled and air uh, emitted among uh, wargamers over the question of whether wargaming is an art or a science. And um, for wargame graphic design, I believe it's neither. Wargame graphic design is a craft. A craft is uh, something that you learn by doing it. Uh, not by reading books, not by study, not by taking courses, but by actually getting your hands dirty, making maps and counters. The problem, as I see it, is that war games, whether they are on the tabletop or on the computer screen, are essentially a visual medium. But very few war gamers are visual thinkers. Most uh, war gamers in the defense, academic, or um, corporate world are trained as uh, analysts or socialized as staff officers or military operational research analysts. If you go to your personnel directorate or your human resources department and uh, tell them that you need a war game graphic designer, what they'll send you probably is someone trained as a commercial illustrator. Now, commercial illustration is the use of visual images to sell products. That's a little bit different from graphic design the use of visual images to communicate ideas. I used to think that if I had a good map and the order of battle uh, list the forces involved in a conflict, I had everything I needed to design a war game. If you, if you give me the stage setting and the actors, we can put on a show. Well, that's not right. That's an analyst perspective. Because you need a lot more than the nouns. You need the verbs. The challenge of war game graphic design is to craft physical systems that make the pieces come alive in the minds of the players. There's a wonderful quote I like from the um, charter of UNESCO, 1949. These were, it was written by people who had just lived through the Second World War. And what they wrote was, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Well, the War game is not taking place on the tabletop or on the computer screen. The war game is taking place in the minds of your players. Unfortunately, much of the time, your players are confused. Think about it. A typical war game is a group of strangers who are thrown together in an unfamiliar environment, right? to deal with a situation of immense complexity. I've seen many good war game designs that were ruined by amateurish graphics. 
On the other hand, the best game design, the best graphics in the world will not rescue a game that has a design that is a hot mess. The tools that the graphic designer has to work with are basically very simple. Shape, color, symbols, size, hierarchy of sizes, different styles and weights of line, thick or thin, dashed or um, solid or double, um, and um, type faces, or as we call it, fonts. Um, if you learn, learn nothing else from what I'm going to tell you today, here's a few basic principles. Don't use primary colors or use them in moderation. Primary colors are like shouting, right? If you use muted colors, pastels, right? It's less of a punch in the eye for a player. Be aware that symbols can often have multiple meanings, especially if your environment is one where people from different cultural backgrounds are participating in your game. Consider um, that symbol in the center of this slide, the skull and crossbones. Uh, that could mean that something is a poison that will kill you, or it could mean that pirates have just taken over your ship. Um, I generally stick to just two typefaces in my work with maps and pieces and charts and tables and cards and all the other physical system components that go into making up a game. I like to stick with Arial Nero and Times New Roman. Why? Because they're universally available on most operating systems and they hold up well in small sizes. You don't want to use typefaces that are hard to read. The subject of graphic file formats is a, a very complicated one, but basically there are two great families of graphic file formats. The bitmap, or sometimes they're called raster or pixel-based formats, and vector or object-based graphic file formats. Your friends are jpeg.jpg, which supports a tremendous range of different colors and creates, you can create graphics up to like 65,000 pixels by square. Um, and PDF, which um, goes very well across different computer platforms. Um, GIF, G-I-F, is obsolete. It has a very limited range of colors. Um, the file format called TIFF, T-I-F-F, -F, is a native format for image scanners. If you're scanning graphics to use in your games, the scanner will often give you TIFF uh, files, which you need to convert into something else, probably. Um, the tool that most graphics professionals use is Adobe Illustrator. Its native format is .ai. Adobe Illustrator format, but it can save in SVG, in PDF, in a variety of other formats. In the Windows environment, .wmf, Windows Metafile, meta is a native graphic file format from Microsoft Office. Sadly, in many of the environments where uh, wargamers need to work, the only tool that's available for creating, manipulating, and managing graphics is PowerPoint. And PowerPoint has truly limited graphic tools. I couldn't do my job if all I had to work with was PowerPoint, but if you're on a classified network, that may be all you've got to work with. The problem that a graphic designer faces in creating war game components, 
I call the four representations. You have to represent time, space, forces, and usually effects. Time, space, matter, and energy, that's everything in the universe. In a war game, the question of time involves things like how long is a turn? And how does this thing end? The problem of space, right, is one of the first choices that the war game designer needs to make. What is the boundary of the battle space I need to represent? Right, and uh, how is it divided? Forces, those are the pieces, the units, the chess men that the players control. How are they represented visually on that surface or in that battle space? And finally, right, the, the verbs, the effects, what happens when those pieces clash and how do we represent that visually? That's war game graphic design in a nutshell. I think of two different ways of representing time. You can think of it as a cycle, or you can think of it in linear terms. And what I've done here is I've taken the months of the year and laid them out uh, in uh, linear using colors to code the four seasons in the Northern Hemisphere. Sorry, Australian friends. Um, or to look at the cycle of the season, spring, summer, and winter, and fall, in a cycle, in a circle. Those are two different ways that you might think of representing the turn record track or the time um, representation on the edge of your battle space. You should never leave your players in doubt about what turn is it? What phase is it? What, where in the cycle are we at any given moment in this war game? I can think of five ways to represent space, whether on a computer screen or a tabletop. The most ancient way, perhaps, is the square grid, familiar to everybody from the chessboard. In many of our war games, we use a hexagonal grid. The hexagonal grid, uh, the honeybees invented millions of years ago. It's an extremely efficient way of tiling a two-dimensional surface. Other ways we can represent spatial relationships are point-to-point -point movement, a node and link diagram, or uh, area movement, what we call zone uh, movement. And something that I think is going to become increasingly important as we need to do things like represent cyber conflict is what I call conceptual space. It's possible that many of our war games in the future will not be played on a geographic map, but rather on some diagrammatic representation of conceptual space. Think about the chessboard. It's an eight by eight grid, right? Alternating squares are black and white. Right, two armies of 16 pieces move across that according to very rigidly defined rules. Chess in the Western world is the paradigmatic war game, right? It's the war game that shapes, right, a lot of the thinking, a lot of the metaphors that tactical, operational, and strategic thinkers will use. They'll use words like gambit right, and end game, and all sorts of metaphors taken from chess. Another very different way of thinking about a square grid is the East Asian game, uh, Go in Japanese, Wei Chi in Chinese, which is played on a 19 by 19 uniform grid with black and white stones 
that are placed not in the square, but on the intersection. Think about that. It only takes four right, pieces to surround a piece on that board. Whereas on a square grid, it takes eight pieces to surround one piece. On a hexagonal grid, if I want to completely surround a space, I only need six pieces, as we see on the um, left-hand side, six red pieces surrounding one blue piece. On the square grid, eight red pieces surrounding one blue piece. The hexagonal grid also right, uh, represents movement in a somewhat more uniform way. If I'm moving diagonally on a square grid, I'm going to move 1.41 time, 1.414 times as far, moving on a diagonal. If I'm moving on a hexagonal grid, however I move, whatever direction, I'm covering the same distance. Movement in all directions is equal. One of the um, best examples of a hex grid, an example of excellence in design, is Mark Herman's map for the board game Empire of the Sun, published in 2005. I asked Mark Herman about this and he said that it was based on a map in a 1943 magazine, right, that was created to follow the Pacific War. Um, now, there's a couple of things that you're going to notice about this map. For one thing, north is not exactly at the top. North is skewed at an angle about 45 degrees. You don't have to follow the cartographic conventions of map creation in the maps that you create for your war games. If it's going to fit your battle space better to the tabletop, or the computer screen. You have to be willing to break some of that frame, some of those rules. Zone movement. This is um, the map that I created for one of my own game designs, Spartacus, a game about the uh, Roman slave rebellion. And uh, what I did was I took the historic provinces of Italy and down the spine of Italy, I created an extra set of mountain zones to represent the difficulty of crossing that terrain. And within some of the zones, I created special spaces which have special effects in the game. This is a good example of a zone movement game. Point to point movement. This is a game, uh, Target Iran, uh, published uh, in the magazine Modern War uh, some years ago. It's a solitaire game. The uh, game system plays the red player and the blue player faces various potential avenues of approach that his units may take towards their targets point-to-point, point, nodes and links. One of the best point-to-point point games, a game I didn't think I was going to like, but it's elegant. And elegant is one of the highest praises that a graphic designer can ever give to another designer's work, is Fallujah, published in Modern War in 2004. It's a very simple game right, that tackles the very complicated problem of representing urban battle space at the operational or tactical level. Um, there's a few symbols that represent various kinds of spaces, and the game is organized in terms of the way that the operational planners thought avenues of approach as the verticals and phase lines as the horizontals. So a point-to-point -point design that captures the way that operators or tacticians 
were thinking about this problem. For me, urban terrain is the hardest problem in graphic design for war games. Why? Because of the enormous three-dimensional complexity of the urban battle space. The problem of intervisibility. On a flat plane, everybody can see everybody else. But in a city that has multi-story buildings and sewers and tunnels, right? The question of who can see who, who can shoot at who, is a non-trivial question. Uh, some uh, examples of how designers have tap tackled this in the past. Classic game, Hue, uh, by John Hill, published in 1973, uh, about the battle that had taken place in 1968. Uh, Dana Lombardi's brilliant game, Streets of Stalingrad, published in 2003. Um, and um, the classic City Fight, which is a, a double blind game, right, in which the players are groping to find each other on two identical boards, rather than a battleship on a much more complicated scale. Urban terrain is a hard problem. Representing forces is, in comparison, a relatively easy problem, right? the pieces. Now, most published war games um, use uh, cardboard counters. They can be single-sided or double-sided. Many of the games that I've done uh, in the last two decades, we've used wooden blocks or plastic tiles because they have a good solid tactile feel for your player. Um, do you use symbols or silhouettes or little pictures on your counters? That's a design decision. The problem of clutter on the board, right, especially for players that are not experienced war gamers is a very difficult problem. I've seen far too many games where enormous towers of pieces, right, were clustered together in a tiny area of the board while the rest of the board was largely empty. Well, that's not good design, right? Um, enormous stacks of counters create information processing problems for your players. Right? You should reduce those enormous stacks to just a few pieces that represent a few decisions that the players have to make. Right? So take the big stack, put it in a holding box off to the side, and have a task force marker on the board. Um, also, especially if you're dealing with a, a, a game that represents the joint environment with sea, air, and land units, or regular forces and special forces, uh, one size fits all may be the wrong answer. You might want different shapes or different um, kinds of pieces to represent air, ground, or naval units or regular versus special forces because they move in different ways and in different environments. The design of counters uh, starts Mike, with- this, Mike, yes. this is uh, Tim, your moderator. We're uh, about three or four minutes out from Q&A. Okay. Heads up. Um, th there's a military standard, military standard 2525D that um, answers in exhaustive detail all the questions you're ever going to have about what symbol represents different kinds of units. Officially, blue or black for friendly icons, red for enemy icons, uh, green for man-made obstacles, yellow for chemical, biological, or nuclear contamination, etc. Et we often use green for allies and green for neutrals. Officially, a lozenge or diamond shape should represent enemy units, but I find that awkward. Different sizes of units 
are represented by different symbols along the top of the rectangle. Um, anything from an army group or a theater of operations down to a fire team or squad. Infantry, based on the crossed rifles of the branch insignia. Armor, the armor symbol is uh, an oval, which is actually not an ellipse, but a round-ended rectangle. Uh, there's things like armored cavalry, flamethrower tanks, which have come back into popularity with the Russian TOS, uh, 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 tank-mounted fire rocket launcher. Artillery or fire is the queen of battle, represented by the cannonball symbol. Marines, right, love their, have their own unique symbology. Naval infantry uh, conventionally is represented by an anchor symbol on cross the, the crossed rifles. Some other important unit types, air defense missile, air defense artillery, combat engineer. Special forces is crossed uh, spears or sometimes just the letters SOF inside. Here's a quick summary of some of the uh, unit type symbols. For warships, we like to use silhouettes. If it's a group of small ships, I use three small ships on the counter. For aircraft, typically I use the aircraft silhouette in what's called the top-down or plan form view. Here's an example of a counter sheet, which I think is excellent except for one thing. Never use red, right? Primary color, punch in the eye. It's hard to read text on a red background. Avoid primary colors. So if that red were pink, this would be nearly perfect. It is never a good idea to clutter your counter design with too much information. If you're putting more than about four numbers on your counter, right, you're going to confuse your players. I see that violated all the time in published games. Effects. Well, no effect is actually very common, but players don't like it. Elimination. The ship is sunk, the aircraft is shot down, but ground units, Modern ground units are anvils armed with feather dusters. They have enormous resilience and, pay, and staying power. Where ships and aircraft, right, are eggshells armed with hammers. They have enormously destructive weapons and they are fragile. Retreat, a variable distance the enemy may or may not pursue. Disruption, suppression, and demoralization. The unit is pinned, right? That may be done by putting a marker on top of it or by flipping it over to the disrupted side. Attrition, the unit loses one or more steps or strength points. Um, often you need to create counters that represent environmental effects, rubble created in the space or contamination in that space, right? Or resource depletion in that space. Those are all counters that need to be designed and created. Hey, Mike. Mike, this is uh, Tim again. I'm sorry. We're, uh, we're about out of time for the presentation. Do you want to just go to your reference uh, slide and uh, we can start asking some questions? One more, one more thing and then I'm done. Okay. The best representation of conceptual space is this 1977 design by Jim Dunnigan called The Plot to Assassinate Hitler. Right. It's a really simple map, but it's brilliant. It's a conceptual map of occupied Europe, right? And um, the, uh, it, rather than actual combat, there's things like recruit, subvert, harass, arrest, execute as the verbs. So in the center, there's a conceptual map of Berlin in, during the war. And then towards the periphery, there's the rest of occupied Europe. No one loved this game when it was published because it was, it was too innovative. But for things like cyber conflict, I recommend this as an example to study. Okay. Uh, I have some uh, 
rep ref recommended references or books, right, that cover some of the things, books that have had a great effect on me, some sources from maps. And uh, this is sometimes called the Markowitz cycle, uh, the proliferation of complexity and ruthless simplification. These are the two phases of war game design. The more times you cycle through this process, the better your game will be. With that, I will turn things over to the moderator. Hey, Mike, this is Tim. Uh, I've got some questions that are, have been uh, logged in. I'll go ahead and start with the uh, first question from Caitlin. And it goes, uh, many of your design principles and elements seem to apply most e easily to operational and tactical war games. How do you see these principles and elements applying differently to strategic level games that deal more with abstract and complex ideas, problems that always have apparent visual representations? Over. That's an excellent question. Um, the way I, would, I approach that is, what do my players need to know, right? And how do I make their life easier with physical components or visual displays. Now, if your game is just a bunch of people sitting around a table arguing, right, there's probably not much I can do to help them with physical components. But if they are making resource allocation decisions, right, a display where they're actually moving pieces into different boxes might be very helpful. Or if they're engaged in planning processes, a time display of phases where they're moving things along that track might be very helpful. So the question of graphic design is, how do I use physical components to make life easier for my players, who you will remember are usually confused most of the time. Does that address the question helpfully? Uh, I'll wait to, to get your answer. Let me uh, jump to uh, another question. Uh, what are some sources for war gamers wanting to learn better map making techniques? perhaps turning historical maps into clean maps for wargaming. Over. Um, read a book on cart cartography, right? The history of cartography. Um, familiarize yourself with some of the uh, tools like, um, certainly Adobe Illustrator, the, the cartographic standard for the defense and intelligence communities is a series of products called ArcGIS, uh, ArcMap, ArcGIS, published by uh, Esri. And uh, learning ArcGIS, it has a steep learning curve. It's a very expensive product if your organization has not licensed it, but that would be an investment in your skills for the future that would prove very valuable if you're gonna be a professional war gamer. Um, the map library at the University of Texas, it's called the Perry Castaneda Map Library, is a wonderful resource because it has all the TPCs, the tactical pilotage charts, and the, um, what are they called? The uh, operational planning charts of the world as large downloadable free files. Um, learn all you can about maps. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I have another question from Caitlin. And uh, first, let me take one of the comments you had in chat. It says you wanted to see the lists of map resources during Q&A, and we'll be, be able to write these slides uh, after the conference is over and you'll be able to have it then. But let me uh, ask uh, another question she has here in Q&A. It says, have you had experience with using 3D technology 
things like GIS landscape or VR slash AR to overcome issues of visibility and 3D space that loses information when represented as a flat plane. For example, difficulty with urban terrain. If so, how well did it work and in what context? Over. That's beyond my knowledge, skill, and experience, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I have a, a question for you. As we, wait, well, I'm sorry, I have another question. I'm, I'll wait up for mine. It says, this is from Evan. He says, what sort of things do you do to make non kinetic like money, political support, et cetera, markers clear and of equal visual importance as kinetic markers? Um, I've actually created sets of play, I've created sets of play money for games, right? So that players, just like in Monopoly, right? Players will physically have to take money from their pile of play money and place it in a bank or allocate it to some box. Um, other non-kinetic things, decks of cards uh, are very useful. Uh, Card-driven or card-based or card-enabled games have been probably one of the most important um, revolutions in war game graphic design in uh, the last generation, right? So think about how cards might help you to represent those variables. Um, that's all I've got on that one. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, I have a question from Brian Train. Uh, he said, Mike, could you talk about your favored methods for limited intelligence? in war games. It has in parentheses blocks, comma, rosters, etc. Over. Um, I like the idea of uh, two-sided counters where um, the, uh, the enemy only sees the side that's blank. Um, the best way, of course, of doing limited intelligence is a double blind game where each player is in a separate room and the only, only the moderator in a third room has the actual picture of the ground truth, right? And players know and see only what they would know and see in a real conflict situation. But logistically, that's very hard to set up and very difficult to, um, to implement. Um, something that I've seen work very well in games is um, uncertainty about what the strength of the unit is until it actually engages in combat. So all the values on that piece, perhaps, are unknown until they're revealed at the moment of contact. Great, thanks Mike. Uh, uh, question from Caitlin says, what is one of the most out of the box visual you have used in a game that works surprisingly well? Um, can I share my screen? It's, I've, I've got it as a backup slide. Okay, yeah, it's up now. Um, the credit for this goes to my friend Phil Pornell. Uh, this is a graphic I created uh, for a space game. It's very simple. It's just a diagram that represents different orbital regimes with the Earth at the center. And, but uh, of all the maps I've created in the last 20 years, this is the one we get the most requests for because I think it helps to understand, you know, what the different kinds of orbits are and how they relate to one another and what some of their parameters might be. So uh, I'm very grateful to, um, to Phil for suggesting this design. All I did was implement it. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, I think, well, we have a time for, I think two more questions. This is from Peter Williams. This is how do you handle time when you have effects on vastly different scale, say operational battles and strategic narratives, or even maritime and land maneuver, over. 
you can create a hierarchy of um, time tracks. So at the top, I'd have uh, months, and then that breaks down to uh, days, and maybe if necessary, that breaks down to hours. A really good implementation of that is the game system designed by Larry Bond and Chris Carlson called Harpoon. Harpoon just released um, um, updated version, Harpoon 5. It's a very mature, polished, and beautiful game system for modern naval combat at the operational to tactical to micro-tactical scale. Take a look at the representation of time in Harpoon 5. That's the way to do it if that's the problem you're confronting. All right, Mike, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna pull this question out of our chat and I'm gonna to try to summarize it, but it's uh, from Brian, Brian Guillory. And he says the issue of symbology is very thorny one. And he says not everybody uses NATO standard symbology. Um, and, it is, and he's asking, is there a universal standard? He said, you'd be surprised what isn't understood by folks not steeped in vernacular of hobby war games. And that'll be our final question. Well, the standard for the Department of Defense is MIL standard 2525D. The most recent version, I think, is June 2014. And as I say, this is mainly uh, a standard that was promulgated for computer user interface design, right? And uh, it runs to, I think, uh, something like 1,700 pages in meticulous Department of Defense detail. Um, it's not standard so much as conventions, right, that you might want to think about, like the convention of using silhouettes for warships and aircraft, right? If um, one of the most difficult design problems I ever uh, faced was a really micro tactical scale game, individual vehicles and fire teams, where I had to create sets of graphics of like tanks and trucks viewed from the top down and groups of soldiers viewed from the top down. And all those had to be created as original graphics. I couldn't just steal them from uh, existing designs. And hey, I'm, I'm not trained as an illustrator, right? I'm just a war gamer. And that, that was a challenge for me to create all those graphics. Hey Mike, uh, I'm sorry we're, out of time, uh, there was a great uh, amount of chat going on while you were speaking, and I hope you get a chance to see that, a lot of good information. And with that, thank you to uh, for your presentation, and thank you all those who participated. And we're out Thank here. you. Take care.